Welcome to our Facebook live broadcast. I'm Steve Altitian. I'm the Director of Client Partnerships here at Lander Home Family Law. Today I'm back with Tristan Dallas, our estate planning attorney. Hey Tristan, how you doing? Hey Steve, how you doing? Thanks for having me again. Well, thank you for coming and I'm doing well. So Tristan, we've talked about why having an estate plan is important for everyone, whether you're old, young, rich, not so rich. Today, let's talk about the how you go about creating a state plan for your clients. Maybe we can hit the processes you use, the documents you create, what some of the end goals are that you're solving, and hopefully maybe we can demystify the process, you know, all the legal terminology, all the 500 year old laws that go into some of these things. Yep. We make them more accessible to people today. Mm -hmm. And with that, Everyone tuned in, please feel free to send us questions while we're on the air. We'll try to get them answered as best we can. So Tristan, let's just start at the beginning. Let's start with the basics. What is an estate plan? Yeah, great, great question. Um, it Really, it can be a lot of things. Uh, I will say the, the, the most known or understood um, structure of an estate plan is uh, having a will, um, and you know some other form of documents that states your uh, intentions and wishes as to your estate or your property in the event of your passing. That's probably what most people think about when they think, oh, I got estate planning, I'm gonna go get a will done. That's part of it. It's definitely not all, um, and it's definitely not the only thing that can be done. In, in reality, estate plan is just, the plan itself is a series of documents that are put together by an attorney on behalf of a client to explain those wishes, but also in those documents is things like a power of attorney or an advanced directive or a disposition of remains. Um, it was an amalgamation of, of documents. And it, it's not just talking about your property or what happens when you die. It's also talking about how, who is explaining who's gonna be um, in what roles in your estate plan, who are the people to contact, how do you want you know you as an individual your remains to be uh, processed or, or or disposed of in the event of a death? Um, you know who do you want to step in if you've got young children? Those types of things. So it's it's definitely having a will. It's definitely potentially having a trust. It's definitely having documents. But the other side of a state plan that a lot of people don't really think about is there's a reason why we call it a plan because it's not just a document. Otherwise, they would just say an estate document or just a will or a trust. It's the plan because we need to make sure that your will, your trust, or what have you coincides or is in line with everything else in your life. So if you've got life insurance, retirement, um, your home, you've got vacation home, you've got a uh, uh, timeshare, that type of thing, you need to make sure that your documents and the ownership or the, the rights into those, uh, those properties or those assets uh, are in line with what and how you've wrote, wrote your, your estate plan or your will, your trust. Well then, let's just start with the when you die part. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, what, we'll start with the will, the last will and testament as they yeah. say. Yeah. Uh, yeah. What is that for? What does it do? How do you make one? Yep. Great. So, I mean, really, it, in, in Oregon specifically, um, you know, each state's a little bit different, but for the most part, all states are going to say it needs to be in writing, um, it needs to be signed um, and witnessed. Those are kind of the, the bare bones as to what a will uh, could be. Um, it doesn't have to be something specific. You can technically write your own will. I would never recommend it because there's, there's sometimes you, you can write things or do things in, in ways in which you don't understand exactly what you've just signed to. Um, but in reality, a will itself just needs to be in writing, just needs to be witnessed. Um, when you have an attorney do it, it's going to explain not just where do you want your assets to go in the event of your passing, but like I mentioned before, it'll state, okay, if you've got young children, who do you want to step in and be a guardian or a custodian? Um, if you know, you're, let's say you're a single mom and you've got two young children, um, let's say father had passed previously. Well, you need to, it'd be great for you to list an individual for the court to look to, to watch over your children um, in the event of your passing. And so the will itself, the document itself, if once you've passed away and there, there's the original or a certified copy, copy, it'll go to the court and the court will say, okay, this is valid. 
and they're going to adhere to your instructions, which is what your will is. It's your instructions. And the probate, which is the process of administering a will, will go through and make sure all of your assets are, put, are together, um, they're accounted for, and then they're gonna legally, through the process, is gonna disseminate or disperse those assets according to your wishes. So the court will distribute it on a probate. You die, unfortunately. And the court says, you're, you want all these things to happen. You want the yep. house to go to X. You want the yep. property to go to Y. And you said then it, it's administered. Who administers it? Great question. Um, in the old days, uh, I say old days, but they used to just say the executor or executrix. Um, that's still a term that's used till today. Most likely a lot of people just say personal representative. Those terms are synonymous. So an executor and a personal representative are relatively the same thing. And that individual was the person you name in your will to state, I want this person to be the individual that deals with the probate attorney, that deals with the probate court and administers my state. So the person who's the, the personal representative in the event of your passing, they're gonna be the one that's gonna do the accounting as to all of your assets. They're gonna go find everything. If you got vacation homes in Canada and you got a timeshare in Mexico, what have you, they're going to find all those assets and they're going to bring them together. Digital, you know, paper assets, any of those things. Um, they're going to find all your bank accounts, anything you own, and they're going to compile it so they can talk with the attorney, explain what's all there, and, and then provide that information to the court. And so it's an important role because you want to be able to find somebody that you trust that's going to be thorough, but also an individual that's um, you're going to be detail oriented so we don't make sure that things are overlooked. Um, obviously, they don't have to do anything on their own. There are attorneys that can help assist with, with that, like, like ourselves, that would be able to assist with a probate process. Um, but that individual is kind of the, let's call it the poster boy or poster girl, for, for lack of a better term, for your estate. They're going to be the, fr the front person. Now, are, they, are there any laws that, that sort of restrict them if... if Let's say you say you want your, your house to go to your brother and your executor slash personal representative says, well, let's give it to your sister and your dad by then. Is, yep. Can they do that? Nope. Nope. They must follow the rules of and the wishes of your document. Um, in the event that your document does not speak to something specifically, a good written or well-written um, a state plan or a will is going to have, you know, a statement about a residue or contingent beneficiaries, those types of things. So really nothing is going to go unallocated in your state. The personal representative or the executor does not have a unilateral authority or autonomy to change the wishes upon that's in your will. So if you state that you want your bank account from on point to go to little brother, that bank account from on point is after administration of the will through probate is going to go to little brother. Um, as long as the little brother is still with us. So um, one, yeah, once you, you've drafted the will, I guess yep. that's why it's so important to come to you. If it's well drafted, you, yep. can, you can be pretty much rest assured that things you want to happen are yep. going to happen. Yeah, and that's, 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 somewhat, that's somewhat great about, about the probate process. And, I, and, and we'll, we'll touch on a little bit when, when we talk about trusts. Um, but some people uh, sometimes will want to avoid probate, but sometimes I actually recommend that that a family goes through it and it it really just depends on on kind of the scenario in, in, in each case uh, but that's the great thing about the probate process that it's so streamlined so uh, put together and, and formulated that it does what's needed to be done to account for everything and make sure everything goes to exactly where it's supposed to and going back to the purpose of the representative they're considered a fiduciary so it's like the highest responsibility for a quote unquote layperson. They have to follow strict rules. And if they were to do anything improper, or if they were to, you know, unilaterally try to change the wishes in somebody's will or hide assets and those types of things, they would be liable for that. Um, as long as it, it, it's found out, they would be on the hook for those things. And so, you know, that individual has a, a great responsibility. It's, it sounds a little bit more daunting than it is, um, but it is a, a, the gravity of the responsibility, the level of responsibility is high. It sounds like the, the will is really a bedrock for what you're doing when you start your estate plan. But let's say, you know, you want to give money to your 
children and your children are 14 when you die. Uh, is there some way that you make it so that they don't get the money right away? I mean, how, how do you affect certain things such as that? I know you mentioned a trust. Yeah, there, there are um, rules uh, um, for transfer to minors. But if, if, you were to, to, if you were to pass away, and let's say you have children who are under the age of 18, like I said, a well-drafted will will have information about a custodian. And a custodian is just an individual that manages the assets of somebody that's underage until that person comes of age or comes to an age in which you have designated in your will. A lot of times it's 22, sometimes it's 18. Excuse me. Um, it could be up to 25. Um, but all that, all that means is if you've got somebody that's 14 and you, you want to make sure they don't get any assets out of your estate until they've reached the age of 18, then a custodian, uh, if you've listed one, it's gonna, that person is going to be essentially given those assets. And if you didn't list one, the court can appoint one um, uh, you know, through the process or, or the attorney can request that one is appointed through the process so that uh, those assets that a 14 year old is not going to come into a lot of money. And then, you know, they're not, yeah. according to the law, they, they're not going to, they're not supposed to manage their own affairs anyway. <laughs> so they're not going to get uh, an inheritance in which, um, you know, that there isn't an adult that's overseeing yeah. that. Can you change your will? Absolutely. You can change your will at any time. Um, the most effective uh, way, if your will is not registered with the court, which, you don't have to register it, um, but sometimes it's beneficial. Um, is if you were to just destroy your copy of your will and instruct your attorney, if they have a, a certified copy of the executed will and destroy those, your will is effectively no longer in existence. If you wanted to change the will and have a new one, each will, especially in the way that, that I draft them, will just state that the will that we're drafting is essentially the foremost will and all previous ones are rejected um, or are you know deemed invalid just to say that okay if there are others out there those aren't valid this is the one that's 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 um, in, in play here but yes you can change your will at any time obviously up until you have passed away <laughs> i like that so let's go to trusts yeah i know there's all kinds of trusts and yeah. they've all got names that are that are unfathomable at, at some point to understand what they are. Could you yeah. kind of fill us in what trusts are and what they do and what they're there for? Yeah. So trusts are, is another vehicle that, be, that can be used in an estate plan, in, in creating a estate plan. Um, the first thing I'll say is the biggest difference between a trust and a will really the, is just avoiding probate. Um, and so we talked about the probate process. It was just the process in which the court goes through in administering your estate. Having a trust can avoid that based on everything that's in the trust. So as long as the trust is funded, you don't necessarily have to go through, go through the probate process and the court process to disseminate or disperse um, any assets in the trust based on your, uh, your guidance, based on your, your wishes in the trust. That being said, when you don't have probate, it means you don't have that backing, so to speak, to say like the court is gonna go through a specific process to make sure I's are dotted, T's are crossed. When you have a trust, you don't really have that because the individual who does the dispersing is the trustee. And so that's the individual you choose if you write a trust to say, all right, in the event of my passing, you're gonna follow the instructions in the trust and um, disperse the assets according to those instructions. But there's no, you're not required to go to court and to, to do those things. Um, but also means that the trustee is probably going to have to do some things like, okay, let's find out where all, all of their um, debts and stuff are and make sure that all the creditors are paid and, and, and all those things. In the probate process, the court makes sure that that happens. In with the trust, not so much. I mean, there is some wiggle room there and I won't get into nitty gritty, but you're kind of a little bit more on your own. Um, that being said as well, the trust has a little bit, I would say a little bit more leeway as to the types of things you can do. And so there are two main types of trusts. You have a um, living trust or a uh, revocable living trust or an irrevocable uh, trust. 
The biggest differences are kind of just in the name. One can be changed at any time. You have a revo revocable living trust. It's a trust that you've created now, you have funded now, and over the course of your lifetime, you can decide, okay, I want to take something out of the trust. I want to put more things into the trust. I don't want, I don't want to have the trust anymore at all. You can do all those things. When you have a irrevocable trust, essentially you put all these things into trust, you've created it, and then it's sealed, for lack of a better term. And what's ever in there and however it's drafted, it's done, it's, it's over with, it's in the trust, the trust owns it, and you can't take it out at all without court order. You would have to go to the court to get to, for them to grant you relief to change within the trust. Because technically, under the law, if you put something into an irrevocable trust, it's no longer part of your estate. You as an individual no longer own that asset. And I'll put in quotations, own that asset. Um, when you have an revocable living trust, the trust is just acting as an extension or arm to you as the individual. And so you can put something into an, an revocable living trust and you can go in and take it out so you don't want that to be in the trust anymore. You still have complete access to use the assets um, uh, whatsoever. In an irrevocable trust, you could have some leeway there to have access to the asset, but in reality, you don't technically own it anymore. So why would anyone do an irrevocable trust yep. if it means they lose complete control of their stuff? Is, there's got to be reason to do it, isn't there? Yeah, great question. Sometimes people want to um, disclaim, quote unquote, disclaim an asset from their estate, um, which could have some tax benefits down the road um, uh, for that individual. Um, or they want to make sure that, you know, creditor can't get to a specific asset. Um, sometimes people do that um, if they're worried about things like that. I've, I've had um, an example is a, a client um, was a co-signer on somebody else's student loan, which was an extreme amount. And that person no longer was paying on that student loan. And so they wanted to make sure that um, the ass some assets they had could not be essentially attacked by, um, you know, a creditor. So an irrevocable trust seemed to make uh, sense in that, in, in, in that case. Um, but it really just depends. A lot of it is usually just trying to move money around and save on taxes or, or any type of yeah. Uh, debt. Yeah. yeah, it makes sense. If you don't own it, you probably don't have to pay taxes on it. So now, let's say you, you create a trust and, or you have someone create a trust mm -hmm. and they no longer have own it. Um, who has control over it? I mean, who, you know, who decides what to do with that stuff at that point? Or how does that, that get done? Yeah. So the, the trustee is the individual that has the autonomy or discretion as to the assets in the trust, given your instruction of how the trust is drafted. When you have a, an irrevocable living trust, nine times out of 10, the trustee is the actual person creating the trust. So Let's say, Steve, we are creating a trust for you. You would be the grantor or settler of the trust. You're the one that's creating the trust. But then you could also be the trustee, which means you are the individual that's managing the trust and the assets within it. So therefore, you've created this trust. You've put assets in it, but you still have access to utilize what's ever in there. And so the trustee is, is very similar to the trustee to a trust is the same as to a personal representative to a will. And so that individual is managing and following the instructions in, inside the trust and making sure that trust is administered in the way in which you want it to be. It, it, like you said, it, it sounds like a flexible way to kind of deal with your stuff um, while you're still dead. So to let, can you put a trust into a will? I mean, can you give someone some of your stuff from, you know, your will and then have that put in a trust? Absolutely, absolutely. Um, and that's actually called a testamentary trust. Um, and that can also be revocable or irrevocable. Um, essentially, it would be a trust within a, a, a will, a drafted will that says, let's say, um, let's say Johnny wrote his will and in the trust, he wanna make sure that anything that goes to his son goes, or uh, Johnny drafts the will and anything that goes to his son goes to a trust for his son. So the trust isn't actually created. It's drafted, the, the terms are there, the words are there, the document is there, but the trust does not 
be come into existence until the owner or the writer or the creator of the trust essentially goes out of existence. So if the, if Johnny was to die, that's when the trust would come to life and anything that was supposed to go to a son will go into the trust. And then the trust would be administered by the trustee, which Johnny can choose. Um, and it'll be followed to the team. Both of these, both wills and trusts, um, sounds like they not only are able to transfer the properties you may want to transfer, but they also are documents that designate somebody to do it for you when you're dead or even, you know, I guess for now. Um, are there any other ways that, that you can use in, in creating an estate plan that can transfer responsibility for your property when you're not dead, before you die? Are there situations that can arise that you need to draft something to do something like that? Yeah. Yeah. Great question. Um, what's, what can be done. So you have your trust and then the trust itself, um, is something that can change and will evolve as you're alive. And so there's, there's kind of that as well. Um, uh, there's that as an option that, you know, something will happen to you now, but you're not passed away. How are things managed? And so anything that's within your trust, you would list the trustee for your trust, which could be you, but then if you have a successor trustee, that person would then step in and act on your behalf in, for managing the trust. But another option that you have is, is dealing with a power of attorney. And a power of attorney would essentially grant another individual the ability to act as if they were you in the event, um, for example, you became incapacitated or, or some other event depending on what you decide and, and, and feel is necessary. For example, um, you could have what's just called like a spring power of attorney. And I've seen things like with this with clients who um, decided they wanted to go into like the Peace Corps or they wanted to do like a mission and they're going to, you know, a quote unquote third world country or a country that's riddled by war and they want to help that way. Where clearly there's a danger there and there's probably a little bit of worry about life. And so they create a power of attorney that says, while I'm overseas or while I'm in this country, this individual has the ability to act on my behalf to make sure that, you know, all of my assets or all of my affairs in America are handled. Um, same way you could do that if you become incapacitated, you get in a car accident, you haven't passed away, but you're unconscious for weeks on end. Then an individual who you have listed and, and given the power to can act on your behalf to manage your bills and pay your pay your bills, all your debts, manage all your assets, and make sure that your day to day life, so to speak, doesn't stop because you're not able to take action. Does the power of attorney last forever i mean does it can't it stop it can yeah i mean you you really you, you can have a durable kind of general power of attorney that that will go on um you know un, in, indefinitely until either you get rid of the document um uh, or revoke the power of attorney in some way which can be doing in writing it can be done by destroying the document like i said it can be done by um you know telling the individuals who um, who have been ri relying on the power of attorney that has been revoked. Um, best way, obviously, is just make sure it's in writing and then everybody knows. Um, but it doesn't have to go on forever. Like I said, it could be for a specific time period. It can be for a specific, um, you know, instance. Um, it could be, you know, which is very common um, kind of in my practice, just having a general power of attorney that doesn't uh, actually activate and, and is only activated when somebody's incapacitated. If they're not incapacitated, it's never active. But while they're incapacitated, it's active. And if they, you know, wake up and they're going, you know, they're, they're, they're normal and they're healthy again, the power of attorney essentially goes dormant. Right. And then if they become incapacitated again, they don't have to redraft the document. The document's already there. The power's already given, but they just can't act until they're incapacitated. It seems like a power of attorney works well then again with a will or a trust. Yeah, kind of I would, wrap I would, around them. yeah, absolutely. I would always recommend that if you're going to draft the will, draft the power of attorney um, in some respects, because anything can happen. And it doesn't necessarily mean that it's going to be fatal. Um, obviously, and I think um, there was a, a, a statistic that I read last year that says about one in three people will have 
been incapacitated in some way in their life. And so it's a very good chance that something is going to happen. What doesn't mean that you'll be unconscious, but something may happen to you where you'll be bedridden or in the hospital mm -hmm. for a long period of time in which if you don't have these things and you've got a mortgage and you've got car payments and you've got, you know, other bills and you've got all these subscriptions and all these things, those things are just going to keep running. And just because you become incapacitated doesn't mean that the mortgage company is going to come looking for the payment. Yeah. Um, so you need to make sure that somebody can manage those things and, and work with those organizations um, uh, in the event of your incapacitation. Talking about um, incapacitation and health, I know that there's, there's a thing called a living will, uh, an advanced directive, um, yeah. appointment of a healthcare representative. Yep. Um, yep. What, is, what are those? Yeah, another great question. So those are very similar to the power of attorney. And so I wanna make sure that we are clear that there's a separation between a power of attorney in, in Oregon. A power of attorney is the individual who's handling your financial um, affairs and assets. So like I said, paying for your home, manage your bank accounts, manage your investments, those types of things. A living will or advanced directive is a quote unquote power of attorney just for your healthcare. And just for things regarding if you become incapacitated, who's going to make the decision as to your treatment? Who is the doctor going to look to? Because they can't ask you because you can't answer any questions. And so they need to go to somebody who, um, uh, who you have listed to make those decisions. Another part of the advanced directive is to explain, okay, if I'm in hospice or if I'm, you know, uh, alive but only kept in a ventilator or will only stay alive while on a ventilator, you can designate to an individual to make the decision if they're going to quote unquote pull the plug or you know take you off ventilation or tube feeding but also part of that document you can actually list if you want to receive those types of treatment at all if a doctor has designated that you're only being kept alive by those things you have a lot of wiggle room there um but there is a difference between an individual who makes choices for your healthcare as opposed to your financial uh, right. endeavors. Right. You, you had mentioned right off at the beginning of this that there's a lot of other things you can do, not just the legal documents. And those are all that we've talked about so far, legal documents, I'm assuming that you would either draft or help them, help them fill out if it was a form. Yep. Um, but you mentioned life insurance, and I thought that was interesting, um, how that would fit into an estate plan. Um, yeah. How can that yeah. work? Great, great question. Um, life insurance is, is, a, is a great tool that a lot of people use, and people kind of just look at it as like, in case of something happens to me, I want to make sure that my family has you know, money to pay for bills and those type of things, cover a mortgage, net, that type of thing, which is a great tool. Um, yeah. And I, I, I would recommend it you know, families to look, look through those things if it made sense. Um, but another way is just some people just want to create, you know, generational wealth um, in a way that they can have a permanent life insurance policy that will make sure that money goes through children for their education and those types of things. Um, but what is important is, and I mentioned this before, is coordinating all of your different pieces of your, your plan. Right. So your life insurance is a part of your estate plan. Um, whether you think of it like that or not, it is. But if you say that I want everything in my, my, my state to go to my son, but in your life insurance, you actually wrote your daughter's name as the beneficiary, that life insurance company is not going to question twice about your estate as to where the money's supposed to go. And if, you know, uh, this is a big issue for, for example, for individuals who get divorced. And they list their life insurance beneficiary as their wife. They get divorced, they pass away, and this could have been years later, and their wife is still listed as a beneficiary. And even though they may have changed their will to say, oh, no, I want all of my assets to go to my children, not my spouse. Like I said, that life insurance company is going to write a check to ex-wife because she's listed as a beneficiary. And so we need to make sure that things are coordinated there. Um, but it's a great tool. You know, life insurance is a big thing that's used in like special needs planning and uh, special needs um, uh, trust and those type of things. And I know we didn't really get into that, uh, you know, today, but, um, you know, it's something that 
like I said, it's a part of your estate planning, whether you, you realize it or not. Same thing with like retirement accounts. It's a part yeah. of your estate planning, whether you think of it like that or not. That, make, that makes complete sense. It, again, your, your job is to not let anything fall through the cracks. Yeah. yeah and yeah, there's a lot of stuff out there. Possible. Um, so you can do as much as you want, I guess, legally, uh, in terms of letting everyone know what your intent is. This is how I want my estate distributed. This is how I want some of my, my money now distributed. Yep. Um, but there are so many little, just, you know, little points that don't necessarily go into those documents. And I know yep. I've heard of a thing called a letter of intent. Of yep. intent. What is that? Yeah, yeah. Um, so it, it's been called a few things. A letter of intent is probably, um, I've heard more used in special needs planning, but essentially it's a document in which it'll explain the things and the, the minor details of your life that don't get put into uh, your will or your trust. For example, with special needs planning, part of the letter of intent is gonna explain the care of, their, of an individual's family member who has special needs. So their, you know, who their doctors are, you know, who their close friends are, where they get treatment, and those types of things. Those things aren't really gonna be within your uh, will or trust. They're not gonna be a part of those documents. Um, but you can create something else that just lists all those things. For people who don't have special needs family members, part of you know a document like that just explains like where are all, all the subscriptions subscriptions you're part of, the clubs you're part of, those types of things. Um, where can they find if you have a safe? What's the what's the safe combination? What's the password to all of any you know electronic uh, assets um, or, or uh, subscriptions or organizations, whether it be Facebook or um, an investment account like E-Trade or anything like that. Have all that in some place. If people, people who have safes or safe deposit boxes, you know, I always recommend do that, create it, put it in a safe deposit box, give the, um, uh, explain to your personal representative or, or who a close friend that where, you know, safe deposit box is so it can be found and those instructions and in, uh, information is gonna be in there. Or give it, give a copy to your your personal representative. You trust them to have it right away. But those, in, in a letter of intent or something like that, is just going to be a, a set um, of you know bulleted information as to you know things that don't go within your will itself or trust. Wow. Well, it sounds like we've covered a lot of the big deals. I mean, you, your will tells you when you die. Trust tells you either when you die or now how you want to divide things and when you want to divide things. Your power of attorney gives power of attorneys, your health directive. Um, you make sure that all the benefit, beneficiary directions are the same so that, like you said, you're not, you're not giving a life insurance policy to someone you don't really want to because you've set your estate plan differently. Yeah. You, you talked about even digital assets, which is cool. So yeah. Thank you very much. I mean, that was a, that's a great explanation. It, it kind of brings it down to why you really need to do something. Yeah. And um, I'd like to thank you again, Tristan. This thank is our you. third one. And uh, they're all great. How, if someone wants to get a hold of us, wants to get a hold of you, do you have any recommendations how to do this, to you know, talk about these kinds of things? Yeah, yeah. If somebody has any questions or, or would like to, you know, um, discuss an estate plan or how to get started or just anything. Um, specifically for this video on Facebook Live, they can look into the description of the video, their information on how to get, get in contact with us, get in contact with Steve um, and get something set up. Um, otherwise, they, they are able to call our office, which our information is also in the um, description uh, below. Um, oh, but, perfect, perfect. Yeah. And, and so again, thank you very much. And I just want to say, you know, thanks everyone else for being here and listening. And like Tristan said, you know, if you have any further questions at all, uh, you can put them down, comments, send them to me, Steve at LanderHomeLaw.com. I'm happy to forward them on. Also, if you have any just questions about what we've talked about today or um, you have any other issues you want to just talk about you think that there's another topic you'd like to hear again shoot me an email so with that you know until next time everyone stay safe
Stay healthy, enjoy the weather, and goodbye. Be well, everyone.